Hello and welcome to my restoration of this Howard 300 Rotovator, manufactured in the late 1960s. The Howard 300 was fitted with a Briggs & Stratton 5 horsepower model 14 engine, but there was also a Howard 350 which was fitted with a Kohler engine. As you can see, this machine has not been used for quite some time and must have been left in a shed for the spiders to take over. Both the rotovator and the engine still have their factory plaques installed which will make it much easier for purchasing replacement parts. As I only recently acquired this rotovator, I'm now going to start with a quick inspection to establish exactly what sort of condition it's in. First of all, let's take a look in the fuel tank. As you can see, we do have some fuel in here, which looks fairly clean, a bit old, and there is some rust at the bottom of the tank, but it really doesn't look too bad. Will the engine turn over? Yes, it looks like it will do, but the recoil clutch is faulty. The throttle cable has detached from the lever. This will likely be replaced anyway. The rest of the machine is just very rusty and is in need of full restoration. So let's get started. To start with, I'm going to remove the main belt guard. I'm then going to remove everything which needs to be taken off for the engine to be removed, starting with the clutch cable, followed by the drive belt. To make it easier to remove the throttle cable, the air filter box is removed. Then once all the bolts have been removed, the engine will lift off the front plate. Clearly the engine has leaked quite a lot of oil over the years but all of the issues which it currently has will be addressed when the engine is rebuilt. I can now disassemble the rest of the machine, continuing with the rear rotor guard. The rods that hold the guard in place are very stuck, especially the lower one. I'm going to need to heat it up and quench it, but first I need to remove one of the wheels to gain better access. After heating the rod up as much as possible, I then quickly pour a bucket of cold water over it to try and crack the rust weld. After repeating this process several times, I did finally manage to get the rod to move. This now enables me to be able to remove the entire guard, revealing the rotors. The handlebars are made up of two sections, the upper and lower, and they're connected via this pin. So I'm just removing the split pin so that can be hammered out of there. The lower section of the handlebars is attached using two bolts. Now the two main rotors can be removed. To do this, there is a large bolt or shaft which runs through the center with a nut on the end. Once that's been removed, the huge bolt can be slid out of there.
The main drive pulley requires a special peg spanner to remove the nut. I don't have one of those tools, so I'm going to quickly make a tool using some scrap metal and two bolts. Hopefully my temporary tool will be strong enough to be able to remove the nut, but just to assist, I'm going to quench the nut. Well, it seemed to work very well. I'll now be keeping a hold of the tool for when I reassemble the machine. The poly can now be removed. As we're now getting close to being able to open up the chain case, I need to drain the oil which is in there. This rotavator has more oil on the outside than it does on the inside. The gear selector support arm has been welded on, which is not original from the factory, so this needs to be cut off and then refitted as it should be. Now that I have more access, I'm going to give this machine a really quick clean using some engine degreaser. This lever on the top of the chain case is used for engaging and disengaging the rotors. With the two bolts removed, the selector can be lifted out of there. The fork on the underside of the selector lever basically sits on the gear and it can slide it from left to right, engaging and disengaging the rotors. The next major component to be removed is the gearbox itself, featuring reverse and two forward gears, low and high. With the many nuts and screws removed, the gearbox can simply be tapped out of position. The wheel hubs are held in place using a wedge-shaped cotter pin, which can be tapped out of position. Of course, like everything else on this machine, it's all very rusty, so I'm having to use a hydraulic puller to remove the hubs. There are now only a few pieces of hardware holding the two chain case halves together. So first, the engine mounting plate needs to be removed. This is followed by a lot of bolts.
With all of the bolts, screws and nuts removed, I can now attempt to persuade the two sides apart. I'm taking extra care just in case I have missed a bolt. Some parts do need some extra assistance. The two sides have finally been separated, revealing a very oily and dirty contents. This curved bar is the chain tensioner, and once refitted that will push against the chain, applying tension. All of the gears can now be removed and safely stored. Despite all the oil which has been in the chain case ever since it was manufactured, it still managed to rust in here. This isn't a major problem though because I will be getting these two halves sandblasted, which will remove the rust. All of the bearings and oil seals will be replaced with brand new ones. The identification plate is simply removed by drilling out the four rivets. The tines on the rotors are quite worn, so when I reassemble this machine, I'll be fitting new ones. I will be rebuilding the engine later in the video, but I first need to remove the clutch housing and the clutch bracket so that these can be sandblasted and powder coated. It looks like it's been a very long time since this engine ran. The clutch is very rusty and the bearing doesn't look good. But for now I'm just going to be removing it and it will be rebuilt later in the video. I'm using a two leg hydraulic puller to remove the clutch as it is quite stuck on the engine shaft. Surprisingly the bearing does turn, but it will be replaced. I continue to prepare all of the parts which are going to be sent for sandblasting and powder coating, including the rims. So I'm breaking the beads on the tyres, then they can be dismounted on this machine. That's the disassembly completed, so most of the parts can now be sent for sandblasting and powder coating. I just thought I'd throw this in here, I captured this fairly large hedgehog on my trail camera overnight.
It's time to restore the gearbox, starting with the disassembly. Once these four screws have been removed, I'll be able to lift the gear shifter plate out. The straight selector is for selecting which gear you're in, and the curved one will change the direction of the machine. And you can see what these selectors look like on the underside of the plate. With the gear selector removed, I can now disassemble the rest of the gearbox, taking note of where each component comes from. As you can see, it is quite dirty in this gearbox. A lot of sludge is built up on the gears. A hydraulic press is used to remove the drive shaft from the bearing. With the exception of some dirt, this gearbox does look to be in very good condition. All of the gears are free from damage. I'm using a punch to remove the selector bars from the gearbox, but of course they could also be pressed out. This brass fitting is the breather for the gearbox, it will allow it to vent. And that completes the disassembly of the gearbox, it can now all be cleaned and sandblasted. All of the parts are now sandblasted, so it's time to powder coat them. Once the powder is applied, the parts are put into the oven at 180 degrees Celsius for 10 to 15 minutes. It's then removed from the oven and left to cool down so the coating can cure. With the gearbox case now finished, it's time to clean up all of the internal components, starting with the shifter. I'm just using some solvent to clean this up. With all the grime and grease removed, it can then be put into the soda blaster for the paint to be removed. The shifters are then given a coat of primer, followed by the finishing top coat. The gears are also cleaned in solvent. The gearbox can now be reassembled.
With the reassembly almost complete, there is just one more thing to do, and that is to polish the breather. And that can now be fitted to the gearbox. The two chain case halves have now returned from the sandblaster, and as you can see they're looking much cleaner. They're also free from rust. Before these are painted, there's a small amount of repair work to do. With the crack welded up, I can now prime the two chain case halves. In case you're wondering why they're not powder coated, it's because there is actually a non-replaceable sealant used on the hubs, and heating the metal up would have likely melted the sealant. Twenty-four hours later, they're now ready for a top coat of orange. While the paint dries, I can now work on repairing this belt guard, which has been repaired in the past, but as you can see, it's looking a bit ugly. I'm lifting the folded sheet metal so the spot welds can be cut. With all of the welds cut, the back plate can now be removed, and this is going to be a great template for reproducing it. With the new back plate fabricated, I can now weld it into place. Unfortunately, the previous repair has left some damage, so I'm just using some heat resistant filler to clean it up. It takes less than 30 minutes for the filler to cure, and then it can be sanded. And there we have the repaired guard. It can now be powder coated. So that I'm not heating up the oven for just one part, I'm also powder coating some other parts as well.
That now concludes all of the powder coating and the parts that were sent off to a professional powder coater have also returned. The main reassembly can now begin. As you can see, I have all the new seals, bushings and bearings. With the bearings and seals installed, the gearbox can now be refitted. The old bushings on the main rotor gear are stuck. So to remove this, I'm welding on some nuts so I can attach a hydraulic puller. I found this to be a very effective method because not only can you attach a hydraulic puller but also the heat generated cracks the rust and expands the component being pulled. The procedure is now repeated on the opposite side. Following a good clean, it's now ready for reassembly with new components. The rotor gear assembly can now be refitted, followed by the drive chain and the drive gears. The internal reassembly is almost complete. All that's left is the final drive axle. A new chain case gasket is fitted. And following a new bearing installation on the opposite half, the two halves can then be bolted together. As you saw on the disassembly, many bolts are used in this procedure. So I've gone ahead and installed all of the new bolts. The main chain case unit reassembly is complete. I can now reassemble the rotors with brand new tines. The two rotor units are finished and these will be fitted to the machine a bit later on. I now have the brand new tyres which need to be mounted onto the rims.
With the tyres mounted, all that's left is to inflate the wheels and then they're ready to be fitted onto the machine. As usual, I'm applying copper grease before installing the hubs, just to make sure that I can easily remove these again in the future if I need to. This is a good time to install the main pulley, as there's better access now before the wheels are fitted. The machine will now stand upright which will make it much easier to work on as it is sitting on its wheels. The rotors can also be installed and this will stabilise the machine at the rear as well. The rotors are then followed by the rotor guard and I have copper greased both of the rods which hold this into place so that they don't get stuck again in the future. The chain case and gearbox is then filled with 900 millilitres of SAE 90 oil. The upper and lower handlebars are then fitted. The handlebars on this rotavator are actually really nice because it has three positions so you can walk to the side of where you're rotavating so that you're not then compacting the area you've worked on. That is the main machine almost fully reassembled. There are just a few more parts to install such as the shift rod and the engine plate and now I need to work on the engine itself. It's time to restore it. Certainly from the exterior, this engine looks to be in poor condition. First I'll remove the drain plug to empty any oil which is in there. It looks like it has previously been drained. Now I can disassemble the engine, starting with the recoil cover or the engine shroud. The carburetor is actually mounted onto the fuel tank, so this is all removed as one unit. To remove the starter recoil clutch, I'm using a special tool, part number 19244 by Briggs & Stratton. Before installing the flywheel puller, I always like to clean the threads first, because if you can't install the flywheel puller's bolts far enough and then you pull, you can potentially crack the flywheel. The puller can now be installed. The way this puller works is by having a large nut on the crankshaft, then when the small nuts are tightened, it's actually pulling up 
on the flywheel. After the very recognisable pop, which always makes me jump, the flywheel can then be removed. Removing the flywheel has then revealed the points in condenser cover. Before the points and condenser can be removed, I also need to remove the ignition coil at the same time. This screw holds the points in position. It's also the same screw which you adjust to set the points. And this is the condenser. It can be easy to miss, but there is also a points plunger, which is essential. The engine cannot run without it. Next, I'm going to remove the cylinder head. As you can see, there are some fairly deep scratches in the side of the bore. It is fairly common for the aluminium balls to have this though. There's also some carbon buildup, but this isn't too bad. Let's take a look inside. I need to remove the sump to reveal the internal components. It's fairly clean in here, there is a bit of sludge build up, but this also is quite common for an old engine. To assist with camshaft removal, it's always best to align the timing marks, then it will simply lift out. The camshaft looks to be in good condition, along with the lobes, they're not worn, so this will be perfectly reusable. We then have the valve tappets, which is what the cam lobes push on to open and close the valves. Although not critical, I am marking them intake and exhaust so that I put them back in the same place. Before I can remove the connecting rod from the crankshaft, I first of all need to bend back the locking tab. This enables me to be able to fit a socket or a spanner onto the bolts. First impressions are very good. The connecting rod looks very clean with no scoring. The crankshaft simply slides out. And with the crankshaft out of the way, I can pop the piston out the top. And this reveals some fairly horrendous scratches on the piston skirt. I will be replacing the piston. Luckily though, I will be able to reuse the connecting rod as it is in very good condition. Following an inspection of the crankshaft, I have determined that, that is also very good. You can see the sludge buildup at the bottom of the crankcase. The grey slime is probably from the piston and the scratch bore that we saw. I will be remaking this Briggs & Stratton identification plaque later. The engine is almost fully stripped down now, but the exhaust elbow is still stuck in the exhaust port. 
Hopefully by quenching it, I'll be able to crack the rust which is holding it into position. Unfortunately, even after quenching it several times, it still won't move, so it's time for plan B. My plan is to weld a T-handled bar onto the end of the cutoff pipe, and hopefully then I will have more leverage Thankfully, this was enough to free it. This was without a doubt the most difficult pipe I've ever had to remove. I spent over an hour in total just trying to remove it. Once the valve breather cover has been removed, I can then remove the valves. To remove the valves, I'm using a valve spring compressor. This is Briggs & Stratton part number 19063. With the oil seal removed, I am now ready to thoroughly clean this engine, and it really is absolutely caked in oily dirt. To clean it, I'm using a heated washer, which is hot degreaser. Following the hot wash, the parts are then put into the soda blaster so that I can remove the old paint.
Other parts such as the cylinder head are cleaned in the sandblaster. The main reason for this is just because the carbon can be quite stubborn to remove and it's a bit more difficult for the soda. To improve the cylinder head further, I'm going to create a nice flat surface by using a granite block and a circular piece of sandpaper. The same process is repeated on the crankcase side. The valves are extremely coated in carbon, so first of all I'm cleaning them in some solvent, then I can wire wheel them to see exactly what sort of condition they're in. The wear is revealed. As you can see, the exhaust valve on the left-hand side is reusable, but it does have some pitting, and the intake valve on the right-hand side is beyond repair and will have to be replaced. Luckily, I have managed to source a new old stock valve. It's really clear to see the difference between the worn one and the new one. The valves are lapped in, so they create a nice tight seal. The new old stock piston and rings have arrived, so I can now get the connecting rod transferred over to the new one. It's always amazing to see the difference between a new piston and an old worn one. To swap the piston on the connecting rod, it is very simple. First of all, the retaining clips are removed, then the piston pin or gudgeon pin is tapped out of position, then the procedure is done in reverse to reassemble. With the piston successfully swapped, the new rings can then be installed. The piston assembly is complete. The engine can now be reassembled, starting with the crankshaft installation. I always like to apply some reassembly oil to the bore prior to installing the piston. You may be wondering why I haven't honed the bore. The reason why is because this engine actually has an aluminium bore rather than a cast iron sleeve. You wouldn't normally hone this type of bore. The connecting rod bolts must be torqued to the correct specification. The valve tappets are then installed followed by the camshaft ensuring that the timing mark is aligned.
Prior to sump installation, a brand new oil seal is installed. Before the sump goes on, it's always a very good idea to apply lots of lubrication. Then the gasket, which I have applied some high tack to. And then the sump. All but two of the sump bolts are installed. The final two are fitted when the clutch plate is installed. I always like to install the valves last. The main reason is because I can then simply check the valve clearances with the valve tappets installed. Exhaust valve, as suspected, is within spec. The intake, however, as it is a new valve, is well out of spec. So I'm using a bench grinder to just very gently grind the end of the stem to adjust it. With the adjustments made, the intake valve also is within spec. The head is fitted with a new head gasket. The head bolts are then torqued in a specific pattern to ensure that the head does not crack or warp. The engine can now be painted in heat proof black. After leaving it to dry for 24 hours, I can now continue the reassembly of the engine. The next part is the ignition coil and the air vane governor, but also connected to this is the points and condenser system. The points are refitted and must be set with a 20 thou gap. Although the old condenser might have worked, I'm fitting a new one for peace of mind. The engine is now ready for the flywheel which I've sandblasted and painted. I established that the old starter recoil clutch was completely worn out so a new one is fitted. The 10 thou gap can be set using a business card or a feeler gauge. The recoil assembly looks to be in poor condition. I'll disassemble it and replace any parts that are worn out.
extra care is taken at this point because the recoil spring can actually pop out and if you're not careful it can hit you in the face. It's all very grimy and the recoil spring will be replaced with a new one. After cleaning all the components in some solvent, I'm now sandblasting them to give them a nice clean finish ready for painting. The black gloss paint which I'm using is petrol resistant which is very handy because this is actually located very close to the fuel tank. The recoil assembly can now be reassembled. I've managed to source a new old stock Briggs & Stratton recoil spring. It does take a bit of practice to wind the spring and then fit it to the assembly, but it is possible. Sometimes it does take several attempts. Once assembled, the new starter rope can be fitted. Once the new pull cord handle has been attached, a knot is tied and then that is the recoil assembly completed. The engine is really coming together now, but I still have to work on the carburetor and fuel tank. So let's remove the carburetor from the tank. As you can see, the pickup tube does have some corrosion, but hopefully the soda blaster will be able to clean this off nicely. Wow, that is some yellowy orange fuel. It is surprisingly clean looking. It must just be old. With the carburetor removed, it can now be disassembled. First I remove the screw and the seat from the carburetor, followed by the fuel pump. Now that the carburetor is fully disassembled, I put it through the soda blaster and it came out like this, looking much better. But I still need to put it into the ultrasonic cleaner to make sure everything is very clean. Mm -hmm. 
Many people ask me what I actually use in my ultrasonic cleaner, and it is just washing up liquid, or dish soap as you may call it. I found it does work very well, but if you do have an extremely dirty carburetor, then it may not be enough. After the carburetor has been in the ultrasonic cleaner for 20 minutes, I then blow compressed air through it, and I also do give it a quick blast through with some carb cleaner. It's now time for reassembly. I set the mixture screw by first of all screwing it in all the way and then I turn it out one and a half turns. The carburetor is finished, but now the fuel tank needs to be sandblasted and powder coated. At the same time as powder coating the fuel tank, I also powder coat other parts, such as the clutch lever, which I'm doing in chrome. Here is the result after 10 to 15 minutes in the oven. And the chrome lever came out very well. Now the carburetor can be fitted to the fuel tank. Finally the carburetor and tank assembly is then fitted to the engine. This wire is for switching off the engine, so it is crucial that it is refitted. Everything is moving along very nicely. The engine is now mounted onto the rotavator. Before we can go any further, the clutch needs to be restored. I start by removing all of the screws around the perimeter of the clutch. The reason why the clutch is in the vise is because sometimes it can actually pop open as it is spring loaded.
Clearly this clutch is not going to pop open without some persuasion. I must warn you, there is a spider about to appear on the screen. If you don't like spiders, please do look away now. I think I might have disturbed its home. It was a bit of a rude awakening for it, but do not worry, it was returned to the garden and it is safe. At least it was when I left it. This is one of the earlier clutches which did not have friction material. Howard did start using friction material on some of the newer clutches. I'm using a press to remove the bearings. As with most parts, I'm using a sandblaster to clean everything up. With all the components sandblasted, I'm now going to apply a nice coat of primer, followed by a top coat of gloss black. The clutch can now be reassembled, starting with some new bearings. As the clutch is spring loaded, I'm using the hydraulic press to compress the spring so that I can install the screws easily. The clutch is finished and it can now be fitted to the rotavator. Before I do fit it though, I'm applying some copper grease to the crankshaft. Then a new drive belt is fitted. This threaded pin is used to hold the clutch housing into position. Then a new clutch cable is fitted ensuring I have it set with the correct engine. The engine plate can now be tightened down as we have the correct belt tension. I'm going to recreate the ID plate for the engine. First of all, I'm giving it a quick sandblast to clean it up. I can then recreate it as a decal on my computer. After cutting out the rectangles where the model, type number and serial number go, it can then be applied to the original plaque.
The original one was actually printed onto the metal, but I'm still happy with how this looks. There are only a few small jobs left to do before I can run the engine. First of all, the air filter box is fitted with a new air filter installed. Then a new genuine muffler. The upper gear shifter linkage is then fitted to the lower linkage. This allows the gears to shift. And then the engine can be filled with oil. I'm using SAE 30. Then once the guard is fitted, it's one of my favorite parts of a restoration, fitting the decals. I used the same process for the machine plaque as I did for the engine plaque, so I had it then printed onto some gold vinyl. Finally, I put some fuel into the tank. I actually used the Aspen fuel in all of my restorations as I do not want the carburetors to go all gummed up and stale. But there we go, the Howard 300 Rotovator is finished. I'll leave you with a demonstration of it working, and I hope to see you in the next restoration video.